I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Joanna Kolosov, a librarian here at History and Genealogy Library in Santa Rosa. And I'm joined by my co-host um, and colleague, Simone Kremkow, who will be in uh, the background taking care of managing this webinar. I'd like to mention a few housekeeping matters, and then I will turn things over to Celia Starr. So we're using um, Zoom's webinar edition, which means that all attendees' microphones and video have been turned off, so no worries. Um, if you have questions for Celia, please enter them into the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. We will have time reserved at the end of the presentation um, in which Celia will be able to respond to your questions. The Q&A feature is different from the chat feature, that is also at the bottom of your screen and chat will be for you to engage with one another, um, share comments and respond to the presentation in real time. So again, if you have questions that you'd like um, to pose to the author at the end of the talk, please put those in the Q&A. And we are recording tonight's presentation and we'll send the link to the email you provided when registering. Sonoma County Library is thrilled to have Celia Starr with us tonight, author of Frida in America, The Creative Awakening of a Great Artist, which was published in 2020 by St. Martin's Press and named in book lists, master list of editor's choice, adult books of 2020. She teaches art history at the University of San Francisco, where she specializes in modern contemporary African and multicultural art. Her talk tonight, Frida Kahlo and the Impact of Place, will focus on Frida's creative and personal journey while living in the United States, with a particular focus on her time in San Francisco and Santa Rosa. And now I'm happy to turn things over to Celia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. And thanks for inviting me. It's, it's really so wonderful to be here. And, you know, I love talking about Frida Kahlo any chance that I get. And it, also to talk about, you know, her time with uh, Luther Burbank, or at least at his home, he wasn't alive when she was, when she was there, but it's, it's wonderful to always talk about her portrait of him. And also, I think it's a fitting time to be talking about Frida Kahlo, because there's this major, you know, exhibition of her husband, Diego Rivera, at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And if you know anybody has gone to see it, then you know that there are uh, three Frida Kahlo paintings in the exhibition and a lot of works uh, from the period in which they were living um, in San Francisco. So let me share my screen and get started. So Frida Kahlo is really known for her bold self-portraits, especially those she created in the 1940s. And this is what struck me the first time I saw this painting, Self-Portrait with Monkey, a fierce warrior with black hair pulled back tightly, showing off a prominent forehead akin to an Aztec warrior and a bird-like unibrow above intense brown eyes. A black spider monkey perched on her shoulder places its paw around this warrior's neck in a protective yet menacing pose that has the potential to strangle her as it clutches a red ribbon that loops around her neck and the monkeys. Yet Frida, the warrior, doesn't look fearful. This woman radiates power. She looks proud of her brown skin and jet black eyebrows, as well as her facial hair just above and below her lips. Standing in front of a dense field of dark green leaves, her red hair ribbon and yellow shirt position her as a very different kind of woman in nature, a theme that's prominent within European art. But Frida doesn't stand nude in nature with an ethereal look on her face as seen here in Renoir's painting. Her artistic vision is radical. 
Kahlo, unlike most of her male predecessors, creates an androgynous warrior-like image, one which redefines woman as nature or sometimes referred to as an earth mother. And this becomes clear when looking at her husband, Diego Rivera's flower cellar from 1926, showing a woman looking off to the side with flowers in front of her as she sells them while nursing her baby. Rivera makes the connection between woman as the giver, nurturer of life and nature quite obvious. Now, while many ancient and continuing traditions around the world revere female spiritual incarnations of the earth, many of the references and images in modern art have been separated from a spiritual referent in all its complexities. For Rivera, the indigenous woman in a post-revolutionary Mexico symbolized a new pride that redefined what it meant to be Mexican. And she could also symbolize the land with all its political and historical associations. The Kahlo, like other women artists before her, created images that gave woman as nature more agency, more power. For example, the German artist Paula Modersen Becker played with this idea in her 1907 self-portrait. Frida saw it in 1931 when she visited the Museum of Modern Art's German painting and sculpture exhibition in New York. Standing in front of a blue curtain, Modersen Becker looks out with large, penetrating eyes that capture the viewer's attention. The camellia twig on her chest appears as if it's growing out of her. Now, in some ways, Frida's strong gaze and connection to nature in the background can be compared to one of her early influences, Leonardo and his Mona Lisa. But Frida makes her connection to nature even stronger with the integration of the leaves, the monkey, and the warrior. Just look into the eyes of the warrior and the monkey. They are one and the same. They command this painting. Now, while Kahlo looked carefully at other artists' works, she ultimately found her own artistic vision, one that often subverted and defied artistic and social conventions. So how did Kahlo ultimately forge this bold, unconventional style? I wanted to know more about Frida Kahlo's creative process and the impact that living in the United States had upon her between 1930 and 1933, a formative period when she came into her own as an artist. Now we associate Frida Kahlo with self-portraits, but while living in San Francisco in 1930 and 31, she had attempted a few, but wasn't happy with them. One she eventually liked was her self-portrait standing alongside her husband, Diego Rivera. And in this painting, Frida and Diego Rivera, which is owned by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Frida conveys some important differences between husband and wife. Diego stands tall, his feet firmly planted on the ground, and his brushes and palette in hand next to Frida, who tilts her head toward her husband, as if to convey her deference to the maestro. Now, many scholars have interpreted Frida's positioning in this painting as symbolic of how she viewed herself at this time, that is, the adoring wife of the great muralist. It was surmised that Frida didn't see herself as an artist at this early stage, one scholar writes, she focused on being his decorative consort and learning how to cook. Now, to see these three Kahlo paintings hanging in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art's Diego Rivera exhibition, surrounded by Rivera's work from the same period of time in San Francisco, one could also draw the conclusion that Rivera was the important artist at this time, not his wife. Now, this was certainly true in terms of how others in this period of 1930-31 viewed the couple, but it's not true in terms of how Frida viewed herself. I discovered in unpublished letters that Frida did see herself as an artist in this early period. She wrote to her mother, quote, we will probably move to, to a hotel so I can paint all day instead of spending my time sweeping floors and stupid stuff like that. Now this written evidence supported my different interpretation of this painting of Frida and Diego. And it helped me to reframe the dominant narrative that Frida did not see herself as an artist when she was in San Francisco. 
Now, details matter when it comes to Frida's art. In terms of color, Frida's vibrant red rebozo hugging her shoulders really stands out. It catches the eye, drawing our attention to this Mexican woman who we learn from the banner above is the artist. The banner also states that Kahlo created the painting for Albert Bender, one of the most important art patrons in the Bay Area. It was a smart move on Frida's part as he loaned it to many exhibitions until 1935 when he donated it to the newly created San Francisco Museum of Art, today SFMOMA. Now the fact that Frida made this painting for Bender and placed the information in the banner above made me think that Frida was more ambitious than most people thought. When I began reading the letters that Frida wrote home to family and friends, I discovered that my hunch was correct. For example, Frida wrote her mother on December 4th, 1930, less than one month after arriving, I am painting because they want me to have an exhibition before we go. It's a good opportunity for me to sell some things and help you more. And if I lose this chance, I will kick myself. A couple of weeks later, she told her mother, I'm painting quite a lot, almost all day long. By February, she reported, I've done six paintings already and people have liked them quite a bit. Now, while Frida's painting may seem to some may seem to some to be a statement of her subordinate role within her marriage, if we look at an earlier drawing she made when she first arrived in San Francisco, and we look more closely at the placement of Frida's hand in the painting, the issue of power begins to shift. So in the drawing, Frida's hand is submerged under Diego's. In the painting, Frida's hand is on top. She has more control. This hand gesture in conjunction with her choice of colors, words in the banner above, and clothing and jewelry are significant. And they complicate what appears to be Frida's subordinate role in the painting. Now this drawing is significant for another reason. If you look closely at Frida's abdomen, you can make out a figure that has been erased. In person, it's much easier to see this male figure with wavy hair on top. Now the erased child in the drawing symbolizes a child that Frida had lost due to an abortion she received in Mexico not long before coming to the United States due to quote, poor pelvic formation and the fetus not being in the correct position. And here is an unfinished painting she made in Mexico that also references her abortion, even though the title says cesarean operation. The drawing and painting both depict the subject of an abortion or the loss of a child due to an abortion, a rare if not unknown subject at this time, and one that is in contrast to the theme of woman as abundant, fertile nature. And I think it's really interesting that while Diego was creating a mural called Allegory of California, featuring a huge white earth mother who holds the natural bounty of California's farms in her left hand, Frida subverted this image by depicting herself, a brown skinned Mexican woman who had lost a child, rejecting the common theme of woman as abundant and fertile nature. Now Frida's independent spirit was championed by her fellow female artist, Lucille Blanche, who lived downstairs from Frida in the Montgomery Street building, and Pele Delap, a young art student at the California School of Fine Arts, known today as the San Francisco Art Institute. They would gather together in Lucille's studio and create drawings, either separately or together, passing around a piece of paper and making a composite drawing. Sometimes they choose a theme like maternity and each drew their own versions as seen in Pele's drawing on the bottom there, where as Pele states, we're looking at quote, a voluptuous woman with flowing red hair and five breasts nursing five babies of different races, end quote. Whatever they drew, it had a witty, wicked touch, Pele said. Now for Frida, this meant including blood, saying in English one night, let's draw the bloodiest thing we can think of. I realized that these nights of creative experimentation led to one of Frida's 
first major breakthroughs in style. So the balanced and the lovely cross-cultural portraits Frida had been creating in San Francisco, like the one on the left of Jean White, suddenly changed in style with portrait of Luther Burbank, a well-known botanist and horticulturist who became famous for his hybrid fruits, vegetables, flowers, and trees. Luther's life's work clearly inspired Frida to deviate from her style and to create the man as a hybrid, part human, part tree. But Mexican and Aztec notions of the interconnectedness of life and death inform this innovative painting as well. And she's incorporated blood. Now, Frida and Diego visited Burbank's house in Santa Rosa while Luther, while Luther, sorry, and while Luther had died in 1926, his widow, Elizabeth, still lived in the house. They had the opportunity to see and experience Luther's beloved gardens, including the huge cedar of Lebanon tree seen here. Luther was buried under it, a fact that was emphasized in his memorial card, which had an image of the tree and this quote, he sleeps at last in the garden where he worked beneath the tree he planted and that he loved. For he himself said once, I should like to feel that my strength is going into the strength of a tree. Now, Frida places Luther's skeleton under the ground and with blood still coursing through it, it nourishes the roots of the tree, which strengthens and sustains the man tree above. Now, Luther's life's work and his burial place uh, clearly you know, inspired Frida. Also, this photo of him holding a philodendron clearly inspired her. But again, the idea to create a hybrid man tree would have seemed natural due to images of Aztec hybrid human plant deities as seen in the upper left, or Day of the Dead skeletons sometimes seen with trees, flowers, and cacti growing from the bones of the skeleton. In the end, Frida had created another radical image. Besides her new hybrid style, she created a frontal image of Luther Burbank as an earth father rather than an earth mother as seen in Diego's mural. Diego also included Burbank in his mural, but he's seen in a profile perspective below and to the right of the earth mother. Now, perhaps Frida's innovative image stems from her admiration of this quote, wise local man, as she told her mother. And maybe there was this identification that she had with the man. It's interesting that a friend compared Frida to a tree after she died, stating, with her death comes the end of the spectacle of a woman who was like a tree, small and weak, but so deeply rooted in the earth of life that death struggled for years to pull her out. Clearly, living in San Francisco and visiting Burbank's home in Santa Rosa had a big impact on Frida as a person and as an artist. She was painting a lot and thinking about having an exhibition. Her style had shifted in important ways due to her depiction of Burbank. Yet her more highly personal taboo subject matter wouldn't manifest until she was in Detroit. So in April of 1932, Frida and Diego arrived by train to Detroit due to Diego's mural commission at the Detroit Institute of Arts. As the two stepped off the train in Detroit, Florence Davies, a reporter for the Detroit News, asked Frida if she too was an artist. Yes, the greatest in the world, Frida said in English. A joke, maybe. But Frida was a master of using her wit to tip the levers of power. It allowed her to flex her independent spirit in an era when she had to toe the line, especially as Diego's wife, because he had to appease his patrons. Perhaps Frida was wondering what type of power she really possessed.
Now, at the time when Frida arrived in Detroit, she had just become aware that she was pregnant. So as spring unfolded, Frida's thoughts, doubts, and concerns about having a child intensified. There were the emotional issues and the physical concerns and fears, the injuries from a bus accident seven years earlier, her history of polio, scoliosis, and her father's epilepsy. Furthermore, the abortion she had had in Mexico one year prior was done due to poor pelvic formation and the fetus not being in the correct position. With all these thoughts and feelings swirling around, Frida went to see the respected Dr. Pratt at Henry Ford Hospital. He was the head of obstetrics and gynecology. After talking to Dr. Pratt about her physical history, she said, quote, given my health, I thought it would be better to have an abortion, end quote. Now, this was a bold statement since, since abortions had become illegal in Michigan in September of 1931. Now, according to the new law, Dr. Pratt couldn't administer, quote, any medicine, drug, substance, or thing whatever, nor could he, quote, employ any instrument or other means whatever with intent thereby to procure miscarriage of any such woman, end quote. Instead, Dr. Pratt circumvented the law by giving Frida quinine and castor oil to take at home in order to induce a miscarriage. Frida followed Dr. Pratt's recommendation, but it didn't work. When she returned for an exam, the doctor informed her that she was still pregnant. He said she, could, she should continue with the pregnancy and deliver by C-section. Frida still had grave concerns, however, she feared that her life could be in danger if she continued with the pregnancy and birth. She questioned Dr. Pratt's opinion, writing to a friend, quote, I'm a mess. I request that you write Dr. Pratt, as he probably did not take into account all the circumstances. And as it is against the law, he may be frightened or something. And later, it will be impossible for me to have an abortion, end quote. Now, even though the 1931 law states that it can be done, quote, to preserve the life of such woman, end quote, it's not clear what circumstances qualify. Frida thought her life could be in danger, but it didn't matter really what she thought, right? In the end, the law prevented Frida from making her own decisions about her body. Now, strangely, um, Michiganders faced um, the same prospects recently, but with the midterm elections, they actually had the opportunity to vote on Prop 3, which enshrines reproductive freedom into the state constitution, and it would override this 1931 ban. And they did, they did vote uh, for, that, for that proposition. But it's interesting you know, how history repeats itself. Now, ultimately, for Frida, um, she, you know, realized she could not have the abortion. So she really just tried to deal with her fears um, to embrace the pregnancy. And she ultimately states, I felt the need to give myself over to the baby. But approximately five weeks later, on the 4th of July, Frida was rushed to the hospital due to severe hemorrhaging from a miscarriage. She bled for three days, accompanied by spinal pain and a fever that stumped doctors. Frida cried out in the hospital, I wish I were dead. I don't want to go on like this. Looking at this drawing Frida made in the hospital after being there five days, she looks like someone who has been through some type of intense experience, stiff neck and a wide eyed blank stare. However, on her gown emerging from her chest under her right shoulder, there's a third eye. This eye looks out with what appears to be a flash of light at the top. It's reminiscent of a third eye with its connotation of perception beyond ordinary sight as seen in some Tibetan and Chinese art. Perhaps Frida is saying that after undergoing this harrowing experience that she's emerged dazed and with perception beyond ordinary sight. This idea is made manifest a day after Frida made this drawing when she made another drawing seen here that depicts that same blank stare but with the addition of otherworldly objects surrounding the bed. It served as a study for her breakthrough painting, Henry Ford Hospital, which foregrounds the artist lying on a blood-soaked bed, 
her naked body small and contorted, her face bearing the blank stare and huge tear of trauma. The symbolic objects surrounding her relate in some way to her miscarriage, her body and the hospital experience. Her metal bed looks hard as it sits in a barren landscape with Ford's River Rouge factory in the background. It looks very different from the actual rooms at the hospital, but Frida has created a symbolic painting, one that references Mexican retablos, small paintings made on tin and sold in the markets to give thanks to Christ, Mary, or a saint for intervening on behalf of a loved one to prevent the loved one's death. In Frida's painting, there are no religious figures, nor is there an inscription giving thanks. Frida's life was spared, but at what price? The 1931 abortion ban had prevented her from deciding what was best for her own health, but the law couldn't prevent her from creating a groundbreaking painting. The fact that Kahlo had a miscarriage isn't remarkable. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, approximately 10 to 20% of pregnancies end in miscarriage. In 1932, however, it was uncommon for women to discuss the physical and emotional pain of miscarriages. In art, it was rare for an artist to choose it as subject matter. The sexualized reclining female nude was not uncommon in Western art, but a nude woman bleeding in bed was really unheard of. This was a revolutionary image, one that is just as strong today as it was in 1932. She had created the bloodiest thing she could imagine, making it incomprehensible to the New York Times critic Howard DeVry, who wrote that the painting was, quote, more obstetrical than aesthetic. Now, if this male critic couldn't understand the power of Henry Ford Hospital, then it's hard to imagine a favorable reaction to my birth. If Henry Ford Hospital was the breakthrough painting that had released Frida's fears to chart the unknown, with my birth, which shows a dead woman giving birth from a frontal position, her fearless spirit soared ever higher in the realm of taboo subject matter. And other women artists ultimately followed, such as Alice Neal with her 1939 childbirth, another radical vision that goes against the grain by showing an unidealized woman giving birth with bruised eyes, swollen breasts, and contorted arms and body. By the 1970s, more and more women artists began using their own bodily experiences as subject matter, taking on the feminist slogan that the personal is political. Frida seemed to understand this con concept back in 1932. She was quite aware of discrimination based upon gender, race, and class, something she had experienced while in the United States. And it's no surprise then that she created two of her most politically charged paintings, Self-Portrait on the Borderline between Mexico and the United States, and My Dress Hangs There. Both are filled with images that are difficult to decipher in a reproduction. It requires viewers to look closely, even when looking at the pa paintings in person. There were many significant objects I noticed once I'd seen the paintings in person at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art's 2008 Frida Kahlo exhibition. And this sparked my interest in conducting more research, which ultimately led to creating a fuller context for understanding the personal, social, political, and creative environment that spawned these works of art, such as Frida seeing breadlines and makeshift housing on the streets of New York or in Central Park, being aware of the repatriation of people of Mexican descent while she was living in Detroit, being aware of the Ford Hunger March on March 7th, 1932, and being aware of racial injustice due to the high profile case uh, called the, Sp the Scottsboro legal case. Now, some of this turmoil can be seen in my dress hangs there. Frida took images from newspaper clippings and collaged them into the foreground of this painting. Now, while I had previously read about the context of these collaged images as coming out of the economic depression, with people in breadlines and protesting, when I saw the painting in person, there were three signs that jumped out at me 
just left of the Manhattan Bridge and seen in a close-up on the bottom right. The three signs say, smash Scottsboro frame up, Negro white workers, and Negro white dressmaker on the picket lines. So I wanted to know why Frida had included these signs. They were taken from newspapers, so she was making a choice as to which photos to cut out and collage into her painting. The sign about black and white dressmaker on the picket lines, of course, takes on significance when you realize that Frida has placed her Tijuana dress front and center. Now, originally, she sketched in a plain dress, such as you can see here, in an early version of the painting on the right. It resembles the white dress seen hanging on her clothesline in Mexico. But her plain dress hanging in New York also echoes the clothesline seen hanging in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where she was living. In either version of the painting, the placement of the dress is significant. Many of the protesters walk underneath her dress as if it's watching over them. What's also significant with these signs is that there's an emphasis on black and white workers united in their call for better wages, job security, and racial justice. The smash Scottsboro frame up sign uses the word smash, a common word at the time that many in the communist party used in protest signs, such as seen here on the left, created by the black activist and communist party member, Ravel Caton, who, who made this image that says smash the color line. And of course, smash means you know, to eradicate. Thus, in the smash Scottsboro frame-up sign, it's stating that the nine black males known as the Scottsboro boys had been unjustly framed for crimes they didn't commit. Now, while I was familiar with the Scottsboro legal case, I hadn't read anything about this case in the scholarship on Frida Kahlo. So I began to do some research into this period of the early 1930s, and I learned that the Communist Party of the United States was promoting unity between black and white workers. Under the party's legal arm called the International Labor Defense, they hired New York criminal um, defense attorney Samuel Leibowitz for the appeals of nine black youths, again referred to as the Scottsboro Boys. These nine youths ranging in age from 19 to 12 had been unjustly accused of raping two white women on a freight train in Alabama toward the end of March in 1931. At their first trial, it was a hung jury, but Judge Hawkins declared a mistrial and sentenced eight of the nine to the electric chair. By November of 1932, the US Supreme Court reversed the conviction due to the Alabama court's failure to provide the youths with adequ adequate legal counsel. And so it's at this point that Samuel Leibowitz takes over the cases. So he, when he takes over the case, um, he, he, the first appeal is for Hayward Patterson. And his chances of being found innocent were promising due to his new lawyer, and also that one of the women, Ruby, Bra Ruby Bates, had recanted her rape accusation. Yet in April of 1933, once again, an all-white jury found Patterson guilty, sentencing him to death. And on April 9th, an outraged public took to the streets in Harlem. And then again on April 25th and on May Day in New York City's Union Square and in Washington, D.C. on May 8th, 1933, led by Haywood Patterson's mother, Janie Patterson. Tensions were so high that the judge presiding over the remaining cases postponed them. So I soon realized that the high profile Scottsboro case combined with the Communist Party's sponsorship of legal services and protests were an important part of Frida's experience while in the United States. She not only would have known about the call for racial and class justice through the newspapers, but she and Diego were caught up in the energy of protest. Diego had begun working on his mural for the new RCA building in Rockefeller Plaza on April 2nd. Both Frida and Diego then were creating during this tense time and both include images of protest and images of black men. In Diego's mural on the left lower side, he shows workers carrying signs that read, want work, not charity, and divided we starve, united we eat. On the right side, Diego emphasizes justice for all with a soldier, 
a white worker, Vladimir Lenin, and a black male worker, and they're all holding hands, seen here in this close-up. Now, it would not be long before Diego's inclusion of Lenin, a Russian communist revolutionary and theorist, would be cause for controversy. On May 4th, Nelson Rockefeller asked Diego to remove Lenin's face from the mural, and Diego refused. Ultimately, he was paid in full, but asked to leave on May 9th, and the mural, which was close to completion, was ultimately destroyed. This prompted more protests in New York City. But before the protests of the destruction of Diego's murals came, the Nazi book burnings occurred on May 10th. And so in 34 towns, university students throughout Germany threw their books by authors such as Bertolt Brecht, Ernest Hemingway, and Helen Keller into fire pits to quote, cleanse the German spirit. The American Jewish Congress had coordinated in advance huge nationwide demonstrations. A crowd estimated at 80 to 100,000 marched through New York City's streets for approximately six hours. You could say that New York City in 1933 was consumed with protest marches. Protesting the huge wealth gap in a capitalist system made more prominent by the economic depression protesting the inequities of a racist legal system that guaranteed a black man would be sentenced to death for raping a white woman, protesting the rise of Nazism with its anti-Semitic government policies and intensive propaganda program, and protesting the suppression of the freedom of expression. After having a fuller understanding of this history, the newspaper clippings of marches collaged in the foreground of Frida's painting became much more than a generalized sign of the times. They made me feel the anguish, pain, frustration, and fear in this tumultuous period, as well as the elation of unity in the face of grave dangers and dire outcomes. In Frida's painting, Lady Liberty stands in the background, her arm held high, with independent actress Mae West in the left middle ground and Frida's Tawana dress hanging in the center. Perhaps Frida is saying that it's time for women to have real political and economic power. Frida's political painting and Diego's political mural were not isolated works of art that expressed such social and political issues. Frida was surrounded by artists who were galvanized by the Scottsboro legal battle that went on for years, See, seen here in Hideo Noda's gouache, Scottsboro Boys, and Isamu Noguchi's sculpture, Death. Furthermore, Frida had seen the Jim Crow system of segregation firsthand when a year before she painted My Dress Hangs There, she'd stopped in Little Rock, Arkansas with her friend and fellow artist, Lucien Block. As the two were walking through the train station, they saw a racist sign that stated, quote, for Negroes, indicating the separate area for boarding. According to Block's granddaughter, Lucienne Allen, quote, Frida insisted my grandmother take this picture of her because they were both angered by such blatant racism, end quote. In Lucienne Block's journal, she wrote of this experience, it is like being in another world, to see such outrageous medievalism, end quote. Now in 2008, when I began researching my book, this was a photograph I'd never seen before and I'd never read anything about it, but it became one of several threads I pulled together to better understand Frida's experiences with racism while in the United States and her use of protest imagery in my dress hangs there or her depiction of a beautiful black woman with an active gaze as seen here in this portrait of Ava Frederick created in San Francisco. Nothing of substance had been written about this portrait of Fre about this portrait or Frida's experiences with racism while in the United States, an important topic that affected her choice of subjects. Now in self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States created while she was in Detroit, Frida depicts two sides of the Mexico-US border with Ford's smoke belching River Rouge factory dominating the US urban landscape 
and the ruins of an Aztec pyramid, a crumbling wall, a skull, two ceramic figurines, flowers, and cacti dominating the left rural landscape. There are distinct differences between the two sides of the border, implying both different cultural values, but also different power dynamics, with Ford's factory playing a dominant role. And I don't think it's an accident that Frida has the American flag going up in smoke. Now, Diego had certainly visualized the differences between Latin America and the US in a similar manner with his set designs for Carlos Chavez's symphony, HP. That is, he was imagining the US as te technologically driven and Latin America as nature driven. Furthermore, we can also see Frida utilizing the exhaust vents seen in another set design that uh, Diego created for HP, which was billed as a Pan-American gesture with the theme of sharing power. Frida, however, was skeptical that a country as powerful as the US would share power. She lamented every day the ugly part of the United States steals a piece of Mexico's beauty. It is a shame, but people have to eat and it is inevitable that the big fish eat the small one. And in her painting, unlike with Diego's generic US machines, she makes it clear that it's Ford's smoking factory that's stealing a piece of Mexico's beauty. Even though Frida and Diego socialized with Henry Ford and his family, Frida knew the industrial mogul was an avowed anti-Semite. He was known for bringing up the quote, Jewish problem at his dinner parties. Frida turned the screw on him at one of his dinner parties by waiting for a lull in the dinner conversation and then turning to him to ask, Mr. Ford, are you Jewish? Now Frida had beat him at his own game and he was left wondering whether this was an innocent question. Furthermore, as a communist sympathizer, Frida supported workers' rights and she would not have approved of Henry Ford's attitude that the poor were to blame for the economic depression. Not only had Henry Ford responded with bullets to 4,000 peaceful protesters uh, asking for some relief in March of 1932, but on New Year's Day in 1933, Ford cut employees' wages for the second time in three years, prompting 9,000 workers to go on strike. A little over a month later, a reproduction of Frida's painting, Self-Portrait on the Borderline, was shown in the February Detroit News article, Wife of Master Mural Painter Gleefully Dabbles in Works of Art, seen on the left. Now, while journalist Florence Davies belittles Frida's talent as an artist with her choice of words gleefully dabbles in the title, she conceded in the article that Frida's, quote, painting is by no means a joke end quote. And it's obvious that Frida is by no means a joke when looking at her standing with perfect posture in the middle of the painting on a border marker. She wears a colonial style floor length pastel pink dress with fitted bodice. And this proper looking woman becomes a provocateur when you notice her tight fitting bodice reveals her nipples. Her obvious brawlessness would have raised eyebrows among the Detroit area's upper crust, but Frida doesn't look ashamed. She stands tall as an independent Mexican woman, symbolized by the lit cigarette in one hand and the paper Mexican flag in the other. She also stands tall as a mestiza, a woman of mixed ethnicities wearing a colonial style dress and a beaded necklace bearing the colors of the Mexican flag. It's a hybrid outfit and it's appropriate as scholar Gloria Anseldua observes, quote, the Mexico-United States border is a site where many different cultures touch each other and the permeable, flexible, and ambiguous shifting grounds lend themselves to hybrid images. Frida plays up her hybridity through her outfit and her connections to both sides of the border. She also plays up her strong gaze, something she had been perfecting as an adolescent seen on the left wearing her father's suit and something she perfect, perfected in painting as she matured as an artist seen on the right in 1940. Now, while she was in the US, her gaze becomes even stronger than in her painting on the borderline with this painting here, self-portrait with necklace, 
begun in Detroit and finished in New York in 1933. So by the time we get to Detroit, Frida had finally created a self-portrait or self-portraits that she liked. Her bravado comes through in her reference to Diego in the Detroit News article stating to Florence Davies, quote, of course, he does pretty well for a little boy, but it is I who am the big artist. Now, even if most didn't recognize this in 1933, today Frida Kahlo has become an icon with her image reproduced on all types of merchandise on a US stamp issued in 2001. Her life and art has been recreated for fictionalized films and documentaries with a new BBC three-part docu-series in the works, an appearance on the show Euphoria, and her work, of course, is featured in exhibitions around the world, which continually break attendance records. Also, the sale of her art at auction is breaking records as well, with a 34.9 million sale recently, making it the highest paid for a Latin American artist. So while all of these various factors, which add to her high profile status, and role as a beloved icon can certainly be seen in a favorable light. For the scholar, Margaret Lindauer, there's a pitfall to Frida's icon status. Quote, Kahlo has become synonymous with a look rather than with her creative production. That is, Frida's look, which is bound up with her self-portraits, is more well known than the contents, context, symbolism, and interpretation of her paintings. To this end, in tracing her creative process in my book, I wanted to look closely at the paintings. I thought it would be incredible if I could somehow discuss the paintings in a way that allowed readers to step into them as if they were rooms. Instead of looking at a work of art from a distance as one might in a gallery or museum, I thought if I could create a greater intimacy between Frida's paintings and readers, then people might gain a deeper understanding of her creative process and the multiple layers of her often profound works of art. My hope is that this cross-cultural journey will inspire people to think about Frida in new and profound ways, to understand her more fully as a complex, brilliant woman who in her early 20s struggled to find her own voice as an artist and person but who ultimately broke through to a signature bold style accompanied by radical subject matter, a powerful combination she would build upon for the rest of her career. Now, I believe Frida had everything inside of her that she needed to produce a major breakthrough in her art before coming to the United States. However, experiencing both her own personal turmoil and the United States' political and social turmoil created a combustible energy that produced works of art, such as Portrait of Luther Burbank, Henry Ford Hospital, My Birth, Self-Portrait on the Borderline, and My Dress Hangs There. As one, as, as one of Frida's favorite authors, D.H. Lawrence said, quote, all art partakes of the spirit of place in which it is produced. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Celia. You really gave us um, so much to respond to. And I really appreciate um, a very deep understanding of place uh, that you painted for us across the United States and um, the impact on cre uh, Frida's creative development. So we've got a lot to, um, to dig into. We have about uh, nine, nine minutes. And I would like to remind everyone that they can put their questions um, into the Q&A feature. I will work my way through these. Um, let's see. So um, 
The first is just a comment. Um, Celia, thanks for doing this talk for us. This is from Lori Trainer. I saw the Rivera show at SF MoMA and also saw the Kahlo show at the De Young in 2020 and heard your virtual talk that you did in conjunction with that exhibit, which was great. Oh, um, she has a follow-up question. Do you know if Frida knew Leonora Carrington, the great female surrealist painter? Uh, some of her imagery reminds me of Carrington's. Yeah, that's a great uh, observation. Um, they, at, at the point when Frida's in in um, the United States, no, she did she did not know her. Um, I think later she does get to know her because Carrington moves to to Mexico, um, and so I think that they they I don't think they became close friends, but um, I think they did you know know each other. But I I don't know that there was you know a closeness there. But it's also something that I ha I have not done a, a extensive research on. So there might be more there than I, I realized, but but definitely in this period, this early period, no, she didn't. Thank you. There was a question about um, from JJ Wilson about um, the the painting um, that featured a toilet on the pedestal. Wondering about if there's a significance yeah. related to that. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting because people really are drawn to that image i that's one of the questions i get the most yeah. it's so interesting yeah but it's astute i mean it, it it does really stand out so it's an astute uh, observation um i think there are a few things that are going on there i mean one is frida's i think having fun with the united states you know kind of saying oh you know we 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 celebrate you know our toilets you know we put we're putting a she's putting a toilet on this uh pedestal like we're like we're because we're known for um you know being so modern like we're so modernized right everything's modernized all this new technology and and i think also it could be a kind of reference to marcel duchamp who was um, associated with the, the Dada movement. He was in New York in 1917, and he becomes very well known for a, a work called Fountain, where he took a men's urinal, he turned it upside down, uh, and he proclaimed it to be art. So he said it was really about the concept. Uh, that that's what what was important. Now, part of what Duchamp though also seems to be referencing here is the same idea about how uh, Americans had this you know new kind of uh, of technology in terms of bathrooms and and running water and you know all these different plumbing. And I think you know for somebody like Duchamp, it was fascinating. And I and Kahlo does comment on not necessarily toilets, but but she is commenting on some of the the things that she's able to um, work with in the U.S. You know, in the kitchen that's different from in Mexico, and and so I think part of it is just like she's having fun with um, a kind of tongue in cheek, you know, like oh yeah, the U.S. is even known for their toilets, you know, and and maybe it's a nod to Duchamp who, uh, you know, like I said, had created this big controversy while he was in New York with that piece. Um, she will later go on to meet him in 1939 when she goes to Paris. And she talks about how he was really her favorite artist that she met when she was in, uh, in Paris. So we have another question from Tom Norton. Did Frida Kahlo influence some of the modern artists such as Magritte or any surrealist artists? Well, that is a, a, a good question. Uh, not, I mean, Magritte, not that I, I, I am aware of. Um, her, her connection with, with surrealism, you know, is, is interesting because she does not, she does not join up with the surrealists. You know, Andre Breton, who was the, the head of surrealism, the father of surrealism, you know, he goes to Mexico to really, uh, in, in large part, see Diego Rivera. But while he's there, of course, he meets Frida and he just, you know, he falls in love with her, but also her art. And he proclaims her to be a natural surrealist. Now, um, 
And then, and then also the reason she's in Paris in 39 is because Breton uh, organizes this exhibit uh, and has her in the exhibit. So this is when, like in 39, we're really seeing this connection to the Surrealists. Although actually in 38, she has her first one person show at the uh, Julian Levy Gallery in New York. And it's a gallery that focused a lot on uh, Surrealist artists. So we do see by 38, 39, this you know, connection with the Surrealists. Now, did she influence any of them? Um, you know, it's it's really hard to, to say. Uh, there's nothing, you know, I, I mean, off the top of my head, I can't think of one artist who said, I mean, okay, Picasso, who's not a Surrealist, he did talk about how she really created, she was like the, the best at creating faces, eyes, um, mouths so he really complimented her a, a lot but um and the, and a lot of the artists loved her when she was in in Paris but I don't know if um if they necessarily talked about her influencing their work that's a little harder to to pin down okay we have some other comments and any other questions from the audience please feel free to put those in the q a um i had a question just um while we're waiting to see if anyone else has more um just how did you learn about frida's visit to uh the bohemian grove which you mentioned in your book in chapter mm -hmm. seven I didn't know if it maybe was just through one of Frida's letters or some someone else mentioned it. No, it was from her letters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, you know, the letters really are so revealing. They just, you know, they, they really opened up this, this world for me. And I, um, but, but also there were times when I had to, to really pull a lot of strands together, you know, like I might have a little piece here, a little piece there. And, um, and so finding sometimes finding photographs like there you know there are photographs when she's at Luther Burbank's house I don't know of any photographs when she's at the Bohemian Grove but um when she, but there are other photographs uh, of her uh with for example um uh Elizabeth Burbank at the house um their dog Bonito <laughs> and uh and also I think it's uh Mrs Burbank's niece was there so, you know, right. both sometimes it's like visual imagery with things she said in the letter and then doing a lot of research and trying to find out more about it. Uh, so, yeah, that was the I, I never knew she'd gone to the Bohemian Grove before that. OK, well, it is seven o'clock as we speak, so I think we will um, wrap up the event. I'd just like to make a few um, closing um, announcements. Um, and of course, to thank you very much, Celia, for joining us. We had incredible interest in um, the subject of Frida Kahlo. And um, basically, I wanted to let everyone know that they should stay tuned for H&G's um, programs in 2023. Uh, in the spring, there will be the opening of our DIY digitization memory lab where you'll be able to book a lab session to digitize and preserve your photos, documents, slides, and VHS tapes. And we will also be hosting more history guest speakers in the new year. So you can follow us on Facebook to track those upcoming events or visit the library's events calendar and under program type, select history and genealogy. So thank you. Thank you very much everyone for attending. And uh, we really appreciated this presentation.